Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, MK Jewi. I'm a technical director at uh, NetApp uh, E-Series Storage Group. And uh, my co-author is Joe Pernell, is software architect in the same group. Uh, today, what we're going to present for you, an actual solution. Okay? And that solution is uh, basically is a solution that we had a, so, uh, we have a product that been sold uh, to a different customers where this product is, is a multi-vendor. Multi-vendor are involved in getting this solution. And whenever you have multi-vendors uh, and you have a problem, everybody point to the other person. It's his fault. No, it's his fault. And we ended up going around to figure out whose fault is that and we, whoever has a problem, fix it. So I get tired of that. So what I did, put, put a team together, and uh, we have at NetApp an innovation challenge that you know, engineers go into small teams for three days. They don't do their daily work. And then what we did, we went and came up with a solution. And we built a prototype. So uh, in, this, in this solution, what we did, we, uh, we, A, we simplified the solution. B, we consolidated. And so I'm going to show you how. So first, I'm going to provide an abstract, then I'll talk about what technology areas this project was involved, OK? And this is going to be productized, but we're not here. We're in development conference. We're not talking about product. But we, will, we are in the process of productizing this. I'll talk about the current problem, uh, show you what the current configuration is or was, and what the new configuration will be, OK? Uh, and uh, how did we solve? We solved the problem. What type of enhancement we did? Okay, and uh, uh, and we have a demo, but the demo here, all what is going to show, is going to show a performance chart that show you how much we were able to boost the performance. Uh, but actual run on an actual uh, a prototype, <clears throat> and also we'll uh, compare for you the. Uh, compare for you the component, the hardware component that's been used, uh, you know, with and without metadata, a metadata controller that's a piece used, and then we'll share with you what are the key takeaway you can take from this presentation. <clears throat> so, basically, uh, th this paper deal we're gonna talk about a simplified architecture. This architecture ba basically uh, show you how show you a solution that can handle high performance, high bandwidth workload using Stornex. Uh, this was, we did this and we create during this, in this solution, we create an, a file, file system metadata controller with a Linux controller running on the E-series controller, uh, the E5700, which is an actual, uh, already a release product. Um, and we did this, the reason is so that we can consolidate hardware and simplify the complexity of the solution uh, so, that, so that we avoid having the issues that we have with the current configuration today. Um, the main essence of the, of the project is what we did, the unique attribute of the solution. We, we separate the data path of the user data from the data path of the metadata. And we did it in such a way without creating extra work for us. We, we use what we have, and we create a container. We took that container, and we put it inside a controller firmware, build it, and run it, and show the result. So you'll see that here in this case, uh, we're going to show you that when we integrated the, uh, the metadata uh, controller, OK, uh, and the storage, they were, we use a, an NVMe coupling driver. Why didn't we use a SCSI coupling driver? Because we don't have one. And we use a NVMe because that's what we're moving to. Okay? So we use stuff that already in development, already done, and we put it into, into, uh, into use. <clears throat> so with that, we greatly uh, reduce the complexity of the architecture and minimize the hardware and the rack space and power and so on and so forth, which I'm going to show you in a little bit. Next. So the technology you can see in this paper are as such. We're going to show you that we have a container. 
Also, we're going to show you that we use SCSI interface, namely fiber channel over SCSI, fiber, fiber channel for the use of data. We use Ethernet plus NVMe coupling driver between the controller and uh, going from the container module uh, via an NVMe coupler driver. And we're going to address some use cases that we have and uh, show you how simple the solution is and how easy to support. Okay? Next. Okay. <clears throat> what is the current problem today? Uh, a little bit more detail. So uh, the current problem today with the MDC application, when they are deployed, they're, they're deployed with Thornax. Okay. Uh, what they're for? They're for, for high bandwidth and low latency. Okay. A requirement. Now, the current solution that we have has multiple components. It has an application server accessing the file system. It has a storage array fiber channel, storage and network for user data. It has a server for file system metadata, a different array system. So now you have two arrays from two different vendors and an, and a, an appliance. Okay, so, uh, <coughs> so you have multiple vendors. And also, uh, we may include additional array solely for metadata storage. The, the resulting solution turned out to be complex, uh, complex to deploy, uh, A, and B, complex to support. Especially when it comes, you have a new configuration, and everybody go, want to go with the new stuff, OK? Even though they are, in some cases, they're not tested. So vendor B will use his latest. Vendor C will use his latest. We use our latest. And try to put that system together is, you know, there it, is, it is, has a probability of failing when you bring it up. Okay? And that's the thing, that's the headache I try to remove from our solution. <clears throat> so, next. So, let me show you. So, this is the, the original configuration that was used. You have the SNFS client connected over fiber channel to this MDC appliance, connect, that's vendor A, and also connected via 6 gig SAS to this storage array for, this is for metadata, and the same SNFS clients are connected to, via fiber channel to this E-series product and stored, connected via 6 gig SAS to the uh, uh, to shelf of drives. Okay, they can be measured at the time because of because to control cost. Mainly those are SED, near line SAS drives. That's what they typically use. So when you look at this system, you'll see you'll see a heterogeneous solution. One, two, three, four. Okay, complex to support, like I mentioned. Okay, because uh, incompatibility, something between versions uh, of code. Uh, a multiple storage arrays, one, two, and expensive, and the rack space is 12 U, okay, for this system too. Now, and the new solution that we're proposing in this paper will be as such. We put this frame test box just to run workload to test the thing, emulating very similar workload that run from the, from the SNFS client. Uh, so we create the data pattern, we put it into this SNFS. We have all what we have, we, what we did, we separate the data path and the metadata path. So we, we created this piece of software, okay, uh, the two containers, the SNFS meta containers, and we bring them via an Ethernet uh, connection. The Ethernet connection is, is on this controller. So this whole box is basically uh, the, these are the heck we stand for host interface card, okay? And that is a fiber channel card. And uh, the Ethernet is an Ethernet connection that we have on the E-series on the E5700, e okay? And then uh, what, what we did, we bring the connection over Ethernet, we take this metadata, and then we take it to the coupling driver and get it into, uh, into storage. So we store both metadata and user data on a split data path to the same array system, okay? Now, um, and we can talk about how, how we improve the performance when we, when we show you the demo. So you look at this, this is a homogeneous system. There is only one neck to choke. If something is wrong, 
No, no, your problem. Okay? It's not going to go vendor A and vendor B. Okay? Then, is it support? Okay? Uh, if there is something that's going to be built, okay, this has already been in our, in our probability matrix, and we have, we have been, we've tested this configuration and verified and certified. Now, metadata and, and data storage are consolidated into one piece of hardware. Uh, we eliminate, we eliminate uh, the metadata server was eliminated and integrated inside the storage. And it is a cheaper solution. We'll share with you how we cut the cost. And also, it's less rack space instead of 12U, it's 6U, right? Next. So what is the proposed solution? Okay. We move the metadata controller into the E5700 using a container and Linux VM. Uh, and we consolidated the hardware to get hardware in terms of having multiple array vendors and the MDC. We consolidated those into the ECS controller. Uh, this law, we, we use the NVMe path for metadata uh, so because for the low latency. Um, also, we provided, uh, we provided SNFS, Ethernet access, as I showed you on the previous slide, to a counterized uh, metadata controller, MDC. Those are the two containers I showed you on, in that dashed block diagram. Um, and we use this 10 gigabit Ethernet port bridge to the container or the, or the virtual machine. Now, we intermix, we intermix in this case, two interface, the fiber channel interface for the data, and then NVMe, NVMe, uh, NVMe for, the, uh, for the metadata. Uh, the <clears throat> and then uh, there is different, we will talk about what different task management we use to protect NVMe in the next slide. Uh, so improvement, we did some improvement for the firmware. And also, we still have additional thing that we would like to enhance, OK, that in those three days we're not able to accomplish, that we'll also outline. With that, I'll pass, pass uh, the baton to you. Joey, go ahead. OK, so um, one of the first things we wanted to do uh, when we wanted to move the uh, SNFS metadata controller into the container infrastructure was to find the path of least resistance um, for us. So uh, the container infrastructure is relatively new to, um, to E-Series. We've uh, just uh, introduced the E5700 with that capability. And so it's NVMe, it, is, it assumes NVMe native, so it didn't have um, a SCSI capability. Uh, so, because we know we're going to be going to NVMe in the future. So this is kind of an interesting bridge for us where we still have SCSI in the mix, but we want to deploy this new technology, to, uh, new to us technology. So um, one, of the, one of the quickest ways we could get things up and running was to use uh, KVM. Um, your first thought would probably be, wow, that's going to be really uh, slow. Well, it, it, it is slow, uh, slower than a native container, but it actually um, is slow in places that don't matter, that don't happen to matter for this use case. Uh, so uh, as Dr. Jibby mentioned, this was a, uh, a three-day project, so in the interest of time, we didn't want to go f track down all the dependencies and satisfy them. Uh, in fact, after the case, we did, we did use a container and, and figure out how to get that working. But during this project, we used the KVM. and. Uh, and to do that, um, we used a, the Vert.io SCSI interface. So basically what we have is we have E-Series LUNs, and the coupling driver presents them as NVMe block devices. And then uh, that's our coupling driver. And then the, those NVMe block devices are presented as a Vert.io SCSI interface to SNFS. So it's kind of this funny mixture of these two things that you would think um, it, all this translation is, is really um, is really getting in the way, but in fact, uh, it, it doesn't very much. So we had 250 microseconds uh, uh, of additional latency that we could drive down if we did that natively, which we think we could. We just didn't for this project. So we have a little bit of deployment flexibility. We know that it will work in either of those environments. Um, so one of the challenges in this project was to provide the SNFS cl uh, client access to the containerized, containerized uh, metadata controller. So. Uh, we mounted an E-Series LUN to install uh, media and provide the storage for the virtual machine. Uh, and again, this is E-Series, this is block storage, just in case anyone's 
Uh, sometimes we have to explain that. Uh, this is, it's NetApp, but it's a block storage device. This is SAN. So um, we, have, we have the SNFS GUI that supports the block, SCSI block devices. So we presented it as a, as a LUN, or as a, a Vert.io SCSI LUN to SNFS, and SF, SNFS was happy to accept those as SCSI devices. And so that was very much the path of least resistance for this project, um, and it was uh, one of the quickest things to get working, actually. Um, leading to the next point, which is the access via the Ethernet bridge, which um, maybe if I'm giving a little bit of the challenge of the project, it's a, it seems like a minor point, but that was actually one of the more difficult things for us to do was to figure out how to punch a hole in our internal uh, network firewall for this and only this to get through to allow us to configure the SNFS clients. Um, so it's, uh, it's something we knew we could do. It was just a matter of knowing the right uh, incantation to get all that stuff working. Uh, one of the most interesting things about this project um, and um, what got me uh, enticed into working on this in the first place is this concept of an intermix of SCSI and NVMe over fabrics mm -hmm. in the same storage device. Um, it's something that um, we have thought about and we have, we have an implementation for NVMe over fabrics, we have an implementation for SCSI, and never the two shall meet was kind of our thought um, going in. But uh, as I'll show later, there's actually a whole lot of shades of gray that you can establish in between those two places that may, customer use cases may actually, um, it may actually enable some customer use cases. Uh, so one of the things here is the, um, you know, the E-Series product is a, a, a SAN, it's a price performance product. So we have very, very high uh, price performance. So our goal, as soon as an I.O. gets into our stack, is to, uh, is to translate it into our own internal structures and uh, you know get it into write cache and use our rate algorithm that we've had uh, you know finally tuned over the last 20 some years. So it's it's interesting that all of that mo most of that is actually not specific to SCSI. In fact, only you know maybe one percent of that is specific to SCSI. So if we could have this uh, common kind of common layer and then a shim layer where um, either you know SCSI or NVMe, they come in, um, and we have all these uh, things that we might have considered a generic command. Well, um, in fact, previously it would have been we would have assumed that it was SCSI, but now we have to kind of create this abstraction layer because we can service either one through the same I/O path. So that allows us to use the RAS features that we already had uh, for many years. Uh, we handle the different mechanisms by which uh, NVMe OF and SCSI. Uh, uh, attached hosts deal with errors. So error and event logging, that's one area that is extremely common between SCSI and NVMe. Um, y you know, you think about it at a high level and you think, well, one is, you know, got this unit, unit attentions are very different from uh, statuses and from asynchronous event requests. It's, it's all very different. Well, the fundamental underpinnings is something happened and you have, in our case, we had hundreds of places where we know exactly what happened and we have an exact sense key and AC and ACQ for SCSI. Well, there's actually an exact NVMe status for that very same thing. Um, so it was able to, we were able to create a, a kind of a thin uh, shim layer over our error and event logging to leverage the same code base for error, uh, error and event logging and for, stat for NVMe statuses and for SCSI unit attentions. Um, Next was uh, access domains. So um, task management functions are, are a challenge. So if you, if you consider the idea that you could have a host group uh, or storage partition having uh, access via SCSI and NVMe OF, um, that opens all kinds of problems and all kinds of questions. What, what do you do when there's a target reset? Um, you know, what do you do? Do you delete the queues or, you know, maybe you do, but that, none of that's established and, and I don't even know if that's a problem that needs to be solved. So one thing we can do is just, is just separate the access domain. So yeah, you can have SCSI and NVMe OF on the same storage array. It's just, um, you know, we create a host or host group concept that can only be accessed by one method uh, per connection. And uh, finally, uh, an, I mentioned the error and event logging is common. You might al also realize that uh, SCSI persistent reservations and NVMe reservations 
are design, uh, specifically designed to be extremely similar. So uh, as of NVMe 1.3, there is a lot of compatibility between the two. Um, there, was, there, was a few, there were a few tw uh, differences in 1.2.1, and those have a lot, mostly been resolved in 1.3. So what, what we see is that we can have the same common persistent reservations slash NVMe reservations layer in our firmware, and then just a thin shim on top for SCSI and for NVMe. So SCSI, um, you know, has the port-based uh, uh, reservations, and NVMe has the logical uh, host identifier-based reservations. But really, those logical reservations are very similar to SCSI third-party reservations. So we had a lot of handling that just kind of um, fell into place. On this slide, um, the things I want to, so first of all, don't, uh, don't focus on the numbers on the right matching the numbers on the left. I grabbed that screen cap from another presentation we did, so those numbers are meaningless. Uh, don't worry about that. Um, the thing I want to focus on on the right is the shim layer that I mentioned. Uh, you know, in the past, what we had was uh, on the top left of the graphic, you know, we have uh, FC, we have SAS, we have iSCSI, we have InfiniBand, and you can, you know, you can imagine all the, all the variations we have on that. Now, uh, the thing below that is this, what we call our SCSI command target driver. Uh, before, it wasn't called the SCSI target driver, it was just called the target driver. So we had to kind of invent this, uh, this new terminology of like, it's not just a target driver. You know, for 20 years it's been SCSI, and it just was assumed to be SCSI from the day it was written. Well, now we have, to, we have to genericize it. Now it's a SCSI command target driver. And actually, the SCSI command target driver is, have, provides a lot of common functionality for the NVMe command target driver to, be, uh, to just pass through. Uh, so we've implemented, uh, then the dark blue, those are the, those are the things that were new for the E5700 product. Uh, we implemented the uh, NVMe transport target driver, uh, and we first uh, released with, uh, with uh, InfiniBand. And, uh, and now we have Ethernet coming. So, but, uh, and then we've got, got a similar shim type of thing going on here uh, for the SCSI command handlers and the NVMe command handlers. There's not a lot of commonality between those two. Um, we do have kind of a common layer in our firmware, but it's, it's a very thin thing. In fact, um, those implementations are pretty distinct. And then finally, this RAID caching engine, that's the thing. We're going to go through that whether it's a SCSI command or an NVMe command. So this, this fear about um, translating between one or another, I think, is kind of unfounded. It's not really a performance problem um, that people might think. I was in another uh, presentation, uh, I think it was two days ago, on Tuesday, uh, where someone said that one of the best kept secrets of NVMe is that really it's, um, we still have SCSI in these systems. You know, in our case, we still have SCSI uh, for, on the E5700. We still have SAS drives on the back. Uh, so I think people hear NVMe and they think it's an all, all NVMe product, and that's a great um, marketing thing. But I think as engineers we know we got the same things running even better with, with the same uh, hardware. That's, uh, that's actually really good for us. Uh, so it's kind of, I, I'd say, it's a good, best kept secret. And then as you can see here, we have the initiator drivers on the bottom. Those are unchanged, although um, stay tuned. Uh, on the left here, we have uh, an intermix matrix that, um, that number one there is, you know, you could just have a big switch. Your product supports NVMe over fabrics or your product supports SCSI, um, one or the other. In fact, um, that is what we did uh, for the E5700. It's basically just a switch, you know. We have um, special uh, package that we give you and it, and it tells you what mode it's in and when, when you have that package applied, you're either running in NVMe mode or you're running in SCSI mode, and you can only do one or the other. Um, that was the easiest decision to make at the time. Um, we were trying to get to market quickly. But as you can see, two, three, four, these are kind of some ideas that we've been kicking around and um, that we could have some kind of common, uh, common implementation uh, supported going forward. So uh, hosts and host groups, I think I mentioned that. You could have a, a host or host group uh, only accept connections from one or the other uh, and let the storage array handle the abstractions. In that case, you're protected from task management and the, all those concerns um, and, the, and the intermixing command sets. You don't, that's not going to happen. It's not a problem. Um, 
Number three there, disk pools. So we have this dynamic disk pools. It's a, it's a technology that sits on top of RAID 6 um, that does uh, basically pseudo random, random hashing to, to find extents uh, and allow dynamic provisioning. Uh, disk pools are something that we could also do. Um, we could also have an attribute on those that says these disk pools can only be accessed via uh, SCSI hosts or host groups or via um, NVMe OF host groups. So that's kind of a third level. And this fourth level, I put it in there. I actually considered not putting it in there because um, I don't think people really like the idea. But one challenge that we have is, you know, data has a lot of gravity. When a customer has something and, um, you know, it's in an existing uh, SCSI uh, kind of setup, and then let's say they want to move to an NVMe setup, uh, one idea, we are simple block storage after all, is really it's, it's kind of agnostic to the protocol. And if you, if you didn't implement a lot of the more advanced features of either SCSI or NVMe, you could just uh, present the data device as one or the other from, from boot to boot, really. Um, but that hasn't really, that's not really a, a productizable thing at this point. It's just, it's just an idea. So I wanted to throw that in there. And if anyone has any reasons why that won't work, uh, please, <laughs> please let me know. Um, we had to make a bunch of uh, functional improvements to the firmware to simplify the configuration for this deployment. Um, one uh, example is we have host driver awareness features in the E-Series product. And what that is, is for SCSI, we track the receipt of report target port groups on every uh, initiator target LUN nexus. So every time we get an RTPG, we set a flag and we, we keep track of these things. And we do this so that we can, uh, so well, first of all, so we don't perform automatic failbacks um, when the host isn't actually attached to a, a path. That would be a really bad thing. Uh, but we also do it so we can tell the customer when they have something misconfigured we can set up an alert. Well, that works great for uh, homogeneous clusters. It works great for the big three OSs, you could say. You know, if you have a Windows, Linux, or VMware, it works great. Uh, what it doesn't work uh, great for, uh, or actually we, we have not designed it to work for at all, is these kind of heterogeneous clusters because it's uh, got so, so much complexity. Now, some of the legacy uh, uh, hosts in this space have used uh, explicit Alua um, in the past, which has caused problems. And we've moved them towards explicit to where we could support something like this in the future. Uh, so this is something that we uh, are looking at fixing um, and allowing default host access. This is not a new idea. I mean, this is maybe just blindingly obvious, but it's just something that has not risen to the top of our priorities. And now it seems to be pretty important. Um, and finally, we want to be able to provide Actually, I have, ever since this, uh, these slides came out, I have a list of things I would like to enhance on this um, that is not in the slides, but provide a uh, failover capability is another thing. Metadata controller, um, we have it running on A, we have it running on B. Um, if a controller uh, reboots uh, unexpectedly, for example, you know, we'll do a forced volume takeover to the alternate controller, and they can resume, but that, um, that functionality has not worked, is not um, plumbed to work all the way up through the container infrastructure to where they could just continue on with the metadata controller the way that they were uh, before the, the fault. So that's something that we would need to implement and we know we could. Um, this was again a proof of concept. So now onto the, onto the results. So here we have a demo of the containerized metadata controller uh, using the Storenex file system and our initial test was to use eight, eight users. This is through the uh, frame test software that Dr. Jibby was referring to. This is a, it, uh, it simulates a real media and entertainment uh, video streaming video type of workload. So this is like, this is 4K uh, video and it's playback, it's simulation, it's, um, it's, it's uh, all the things that they do. It simulates actually a whole lot of different uh, use cases, but they're all high bandwidth uh, and small number of files. So this is why it's a very good workload for us to take over the metadata controller workload is it's the, the actual metadata associated with this is small and random. So it's not uh, the, the amount of IO is small 
and the IOs are random. So that's an easy one for us to absorb with the headroom that we have. So we have eight simultaneous users, two write and six read. Um, and we had zero dropped frames. This was in our POC. This was, we were midnight hour of, our, of day three of our project was to get this graph done, right? Um, so the overall latency here is, uh, you can see, is about 17 milliseconds. Um, compared to our current, the, the product that is previously has been deployed, which is, was the, um, the solution that had a separate metadata controller, and uh, that was only four users. So we've doubled the users, and we've uh, decreased the latency. Part of that is that we're on the new platform, right? It's the E5700 compared to the E5600. The main focus is not that it's gotten better. The main focus is that it's good, and it moved the container into the controller. So the metadata, con the metadata controller is running inside of our controller, and we don't have a separate appliance that's needed. And then in this configuration, we don't have SSDs, what we have. What we have, we have 12 volume group, 12 volumes, A plus two, RAID six, okay? Uh, with 10K drives, uh, that's what we did. And all of them are HDDs. So, uh, and that, I know that's, a, that's an eye chart, but this is actually what we measured on the system. So you'll see here, I know you cannot read it from the back, but this is here. The average is 16.9 16 millisecond. That's what we measured from the experiment uh, uh, the, from the demo. And we did it multiple times. So it's not like a peak, uh, it's minimum. It's actually, it was sustained by, it's an average value that we got across multiple tests. Good. And yeah, just to, to touch on again, the price performance is really the play for E-Series. So we're trying to, uh, tr trying to show that we can t handle that same workload um, in a smaller footprint, smaller power, and all that. And uh, simplicity is another thing. We don't, this is not about you know, the customers deciding to move something into the cloud or things like that. This is about you can do this with the rack that you have today, with the storage array you want to replace today, uh, and you could put two of these where you have one, right? Is kind of the idea. Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, so after consolidating all these components and eliminating the MDC appliance uh, and uh, disk shelf for the appliance, uh, I did what I did. I did actual cost of. Vendor A, vendor B, and vendor C, plus the appliance, plus the drives and everything, I get an X, and then for the previous, and uh, then the, the, the same thing for the configuration of this paper, and what we saved, we saved a total of 36% reduction in cost. Uh, and also, we went from 12U to 6U, so we cut, we cut the rack space by, by half. Okay, and also uh, we did, of course, when you have less rack space, less component, that's less power too. That's what we did. Uh, so yeah, we simplified the support chain from three independent companies to one company so that we can handle the support. And uh, the people that are very happy about is our support group, okay? Because they always can say, engineering, that's your problem. They don't need to go point to the other customers. Uh, the throughput is almost twice. You see the 40 versus 16, 1699, 16.99 uh, latency. So that's our uh, And we did this. We didn't do any tuning to the array system. We didn't go and say, oh, let's tune the cache and whatnot. No. We took the previous system and we run test. And we take the same, same similar system, and we run the method presented in this paper. And that's what, those are the performance numbers that we got. Um, and still, we still, you mentioned about the 250 microsecond that was in, introduced, that we can also reduce that. So there is other headrooms to improve that, okay? Uh, I mean, there's, we could have used SSDs and make it, no, but we want to compare Apple to Apples, okay? Uh, next. So what are the key points I'd like you to take from this presentation? 
uh, is basically, uh, you know, we actually build this product, okay? We build it as part of an innovation challenge, all right? We demo to our executive, okay? And we show them that we can, we can, you know, we consolidate the hardware, and we made sure that the user data and the metadata are in two separate branches. That's give us the, give us the, the low latency that we end up with. Um, also, removing the Linux container uh, and use better hardware. And very important is uh, reducing the support, the, the supply chain and the support by reducing the hardware and number of component. And we showed with you that, we showed you that there is a 36% cut in cost, uh, half the, uh, almost half the latency, and almost half the rack space, and, uh, and also less power. Um, you see that we did this, you know, we intermix between uh, two different protocols, and we get the best out of each, and uh, we use them simultaneously in terms of handling data and metadata, okay? Uh, and also, uh, uh, the sustained latency that we saw, that the low latency, uh, is something that, actually, we did some calculation before we build this, okay, before, and we came very close to what we calculated. <clears throat> and also, the file system metadata, the requests directly were served from the storage array over the Ethernet. So, with that, this is a solution that we are productizing. We are working on this. Uh, but we already have a prototype in hand. And that's what we're going to show with you. That's all that we have. And what we would like, we'd like to recognize the rest of the team members that work with us, uh, Dean Lang and Anthony Gitchell and Amin Benani. They were part of the team. Uh, you know, they were, were a five-member team that built this uh, project. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs>